Welcome to the month of October. Some might consider this to be the beginning of the holiday season when we intentionally decorate for Halloween, then Thanksgiving, and traditionally speaking, Christmas. By the way, I really think it's okay to say Happy Holidays and Merry Christmas. After all, we overspend on Christmas shopping, and most businesses are closed on December 25th in recognition of Christmas Day, which is printed on our calendars. I'm just keeping it real. But back to Halloween. One of my neighbors went so all out with his Halloween decorations that the other adults on the block have decided to trick or treat with the kids just to get what we assume will be the best variety of candy ever. And I'm really looking forward to that. Over the years, society has made Halloween much less scary than when I was a kid. And the only options for costumes were ghosts, witches, the werewolf, Dracula, and Frankenstein with a green plastic face mask. Ooh, masks. Those are really scary these days. In recent years, Halloween costumes have largely been representative of Marvel heroes and sheroes ushering in a new normal that makes Halloween more fun and less scary. And that new normal got me to pondering this question. How can we take the scariness out of diversity, inclusion, and belonging? When I'm coaching executives or working with leaders and their teams, I like to remind people that what makes us different from each other makes us valuable to the team. And that can be done in three simple steps that I'll get to in a few minutes. For now, let's explore the brain and how it operates when it feels threatened. First, we need to understand that as complex as our brains are, they are essentially designed to keep us safe. The amygdala, or the fast brain, quickly assumes that something or someone different is a threat and reacts based on what the brain has previously identified as a threat. The prefrontal cortex, or the slow brain, takes the time to process something or someone that is different and responds. Notice the difference in those two words, react or respond. When we encounter a situation or person that is different from our normal, and when we stop to think clearly and choose how we respond to different situations and people, that's what's called operating by the slow brain. The amygdala, or the fast brain, is located here at the base of the neck, while the prefrontal cortex, or the slow brain, is located at the front of the brain. Just as an aside, I find it interesting that the fast brain is located at the base of the neck where it can kind of hide out and run on autopilot. That's how you get home on your same route and not register what you've seen and wonder how you got home so fast. Whereas the slow brain is located at the front of your head and is ready to help you make sense of your world if you're willing to be intentional about how you will act. More about that later. The task of thinking with your slow brain actually requires more energy than the fast brain being on autopilot, which is why we tend to operate on autopilot most of the time. It's just less taxing. It can be likened to the initial stages of the pandemic when people were stocking up on toilet paper. We saw everyone else stocking up on toilet paper and the fast brain took over and got on the bandwagon. Conversely, thinking about how much toilet paper we already had and being realistic about how much more we really needed, then buying according to the real need versus the false sense of need is an example of the slow brain at work. You may be wondering how this ties back to taking the scariness out of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. It's really very simple. Too often in our lives, we consider people or groups of people who are different from us as a potential threat to us, and therefore, that perceived threat is scary. And, unfortunately, we've been conditioned to think this way. Before I go on, I need you to remember that we all have biases. It's often been said that if you have a brain, you have bias. The challenge comes in identifying our biases and having the courage to examine and manage those biases accordingly. Since childhood, we have been conditioned to have biases, either through our upbringing or through what we've been shown in the media, read in books, seen in movies and TV, or via social media platforms and the influencers who reach us through those platforms. 
Often, those biases are reflected in the filters of assumptions, interpretations, and limiting beliefs we associate with people or groups of people different from us for whatever reason. And biases are not always associated with people different from us. Some people see others who look just like them, and based on how that other person presents, we then project the status of threat without knowing anything about the other person. Here's what I find scary. People who walk around on autopilot, being led by the fast brain, and continuing to buy into the assumptions, interpretations, and limiting beliefs they associate with people or groups of people different from them for whatever reason. Those are called stereotypes. And because of our biases being so ingrained, either intentionally or subconsciously, people find it scary to even have the conversation about diversity, inclusion, and belonging. As a result, some people are extremely defensive about their position on diversity, inclusion, and belonging, while other people simply shut down. In either case, I believe people are just afraid to keep it real and engage in self-discovery that may lead to some realizations they don't want to own. To remove the scariness from diversity, inclusion, and belonging efforts, we must all first own our situation so we can own our solutions and own our successes. To own our situation requires us to decouple the journey of self-discovery from shame and blame. Then, we can own our own solutions by reframing self-discovery as an opportunity to know and grow. And we can own our successes by intentionally focusing on cultivating human affirming behaviors that will lead to more effective interpersonal exchanges and result in creating the future cultures we want at work. Now, I completely recognize that all of this work can't be done overnight. It can't be done within five years. Culture change takes approximately seven to 10 years to take place. And once it happens, it must be nurtured for the life of the organization. An example I like to use is this. If someone needs a blood transfusion to save their life, once they are healed, that life-saving blood doesn't drain out of their pinky toe. That life-saving blood will circulate in their body for the rest of their lives. And in the same way, the transfusion of more human affirming behaviors specific to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. The more we incorporate those into the body of an organization, that should not be allowed to drain out once it seems the patient has recovered. In order to sustain the new corporate culture, it must be seen as critical to the life of the organization forever, period, full stop. So how do we get there? Remember that organizations are made up of individuals. Therefore, we each must take the individual responsibility to be intentional about how we act. Now, ACT is an acronym that I've developed, and you may have heard me use it lately when I speak at virtual conferences, and it stands for this. Approach others with an open heart, connect to understand, and tap into diversity by being culturally curious. Let's start from the top. When I talk about approaching others with an open heart, this is really a self-focused activity not self-centered, self-focused. Before we engage with someone different from us that we may consider a potential threat for whatever reason, it requires us to suspend those assumptions, interpretations, and limiting beliefs we may have about that other person or group of people before we ever open our mouths. That can be a challenge because as we've already discussed, if you have a brain, you have bias. So in order to approach others with an open heart, we have to be open and willing to move some things out of our own way. Next, when we connect to understand someone else, it's not for the purposes of being understood. It is an other focused activity and connecting to understand is certainly not for the purposes of responding. Be intentional about connecting to understand someone else's life experiences, perspectives, and ways of being. That's all. And when you've successfully connected to understand someone else, it will compel them to want to understand you. Finally, tap into diversity by being culturally curious. You may assume I mean limiting cultural curiosity to a one-to-one -one encounter. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Being culturally curious can extend to the organizational subcultures that you interact with at work. 
for example, it's just as important to understand the organizational subcultures of executives, engineers, and executive assistants as a whole, as it is to tap into diversity by developing real relationships on an individual basis. Being intentional about developing real relationships through more human affirming behaviors will absolutely take the scariness out of diversity, inclusion, and belonging. This month, my Allies in Action crew and I will explore what has made diversity, inclusion, and belonging conversations scary for them and how they overcame those fears in ways that resulted in new and deep relationships that were completely unexpected. In my lived experiences episode, I'm going to be talking with three gentlemen who are leading a cultural transformation in the workplace and hear their very perspectives on what they found scary and how they are overcoming organizational assumptions, interpretations, and limiting beliefs specific to diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Finally, I'm going to have a real conversation with Dr. Don Chick, an organizational change subject matter expert, to share with us the connection between diversity and leadership to culture and innovation, which can be scary when we consider the advances of AI and blockchain technology. My goal this month is to take the scariness out of diversity, inclusion, and belonging conversations so that the only thing that scares you on Halloween is realizing the amount of calories you're taking in as you inspect the kids' candy. Until next time, this is Dr. Nita reminding you to stay blessed and keep it real. <laughs>